under the bus straight away and put me up first. Yo. I, told, I saw your line. You clicking or me? Welcome, everyone, to our very early talk. Uh, I think you had some words about that you wanted to get uh, to. Who stayed up too late and drank too much? No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Well, I want to say thanks for uh, coming to our wellness talk first thing in the morning. If you did, thanks for joining us. Uh, I think we're contractually obligated to put this stuff on the screen. Uh, at this point, if you haven't downloaded the event app, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, the event started, in case you didn't know. Uh, I didn't change the QR code, so you're good. Okay. I was going to. We were going to change the QR codes. <laughs> uh, we did not. I want to say thanks to uh, our keynote speakers from last night. Um, <laughs> actually, do, uh, there was a relevance that was mentioned last night. Um, Kyle, you mentioned celebrating the small wins. And I think through my entire coaching career, the biggest thing that I can tell all of you is to make sure you celebrate them along the way because they are few and far between. Um, so recognize that as a journey and make sure you celebrate them along the way. Uh, so parental advisory, uh, anyone that's ever seen me on a webinar or anything knows that I just, at this point in my life, I'm a grown-ass adult and I can't help myself but to swear. Uh, it's going to happen if you're offended by those words, probably not the place for you. <laughs> so before we start, I want to take a second <clears throat> and we're going to get a little weird, right? We as an industry are unhealthy, we come to things like this, we drink too much, we abuse our bodies, uh, all in the name of hanging out with our friends that we only see occasionally. The goal of the conference is to take and elevate everybody. And I'm 44 years old now, and at 30, or at 25, or hell, even at 37, I would have come to a talk like this and I would have said, ah, oh, this is a bunch of bullshit and I don't need it. Uh, sometime around 2020, around the beginning of COVID, I uh, actually saw Nigel Moore in like literally the very last event uh, before COVID hit, uh, give a keynote and kind of lean into meditation as a thing that's helped him. And it's very much helped me. So I encourage everyone here today to keep a little bit of an open mind. We are definitely going to, there, there will be some guided breathing here in a couple minutes. It'll be short. You can choose not to do it. Uh, but keep an open mind. Over to you. So the goal today like, is not to motivate you. I think motivation is good until it's not. Um, thanks for the photo, Adam, who you'll hopefully hear speak later on. I realize that for me personally, whenever I go to events, I leave very motivated and then just forget that I'm motivated. So the goal is actually to give you tools and frameworks that you can use Hopefully forever. Um, I want to shout out Ray because we had a conversation yesterday. Um, Ray has been using the tools and frameworks for almost a year now um, and is down 87 pounds. And the best comment that you made to me, yeah. Uh, Woo! But the best comment that you made to me yesterday was it just is normal now. You don't have to think about it. And that's the goal is to make it normal like to make it part of your life and not like have to overly think about it and that's the tools and frameworks that we're going to deliver today some of them so who am i if you don't get the reference it makes me laugh every single time <laughs> thanks thanks <clears throat> um i want to i guess humanize myself a little bit because again i went to talks before and i'm like yeah fucking easy for you dickhead um a former person of myself when i used to coach in the gym floor and didn't have any other responsibilities and just edited of tubber and spent eight hours in the gym wouldn't have been able to relate, but me now, I'm a coach. Um, I coach anywhere between 90 and 100 people at a time, virtually. A business owner, which involves travel, a fucking desk job, um, so I can relate to the bits and pieces that, that you guys will go through in, in terms of your job. I'm a father, um, which is another full-time job that I have. I have a four-year-old daughter whose attitude is getting out of fucking control, and apparently now a public speaker. Hasn't always been this way. So a previous version of me before coaching, before training, um, will go malnourished over the alcohol-induced nights out. Um, my party trick used to be 
necking a bottle of Hennessy in one go. Wouldn't recommend, and I will not be doing it anytime this week. <laughs> I did manage to build a business out of this back home in Belfast. So I used to provide transport to nightclubs outside the city, um, which just gave me an excuse to make money and get drunk at the same time. Good times. Um, this is an abstract for, I was in the local newspaper for a week. Um, they didn't see it in a positive light, but it was good for business. Now, um, less malnourished. I still do consume alcohol. This is me at the Belfast lifting camp. So I run events five or six times a year um, and join a point of Guinness while on my group call with a bunch of clients in the, in the room. And that bottom photo is our Colorado event, which was actually this exact day. It started this exact day last year. Um, so still bringing people together just in a slightly healthier way. Oh, me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I couldn't help it. Oh, yeah, me. Yeah, so I'm Jason Slagle. I think many people here know me already. Uh, so I wanted to give you a little bit of what I consider my identity. Uh, I consider myself a badge thief. Uh, not just a badge thief for badge thief. Uh, I tend to try to not take myself too seriously. The world is fucked up and serious and everything is broken almost all of the time. And we can fix it, and we can try to work to fix it, and we can be all shitty and serious as we try to fix it, or we can just embrace the chaos. Uh, so I am a chaos generator. Uh, I steal badges because it's good-hearted nature, or good-hearted fun, while causing chaos, right? Like, I would never steal a badge to a conference I wasn't already at, but I mean, I've had, that's Patrick Beggs' badge, the CISO of ConnectWise. I get McGee's badge at almost every event. Uh, it's no fun here. This event realized that if they put me in charge of badges, it takes the fun out of stealing them. <laughs> and it, it seems to have worked. Uh, I identify as a weightlifter now, which is uh, a change that I've never had in my life, right? It's, it's a thing that I've done cardio and it attempts to lose weight and to change my identity there. It's fun, I like running. I'm like this guy who, uh, uh, clap if you want him to run a 5K with us in the morning. <laughs> Everybody who is clapping will also be running a 5K in the morning. Uh, yeah, we are running tomorrow morning. Uh, I'll put something in the Whova app. Uh, I got to get with Topper and Harden to figure out when we're going to do it. I'm a father, two young boys. Uh, they're 9 and 12 now. Uh, scout leader is part of that. They're fun. I love my family. They'll actually be here. I'm missing their last week of school. Uh, I'm staying for the lifting camp that we're doing right after this. And uh, uh, they're flying out next Saturday to spend some time down here. And I'm a public speaker. I got a picture of me in the lower right there. Uh, one of my most recent, probably super positive wins. Uh, I put together a four hour workshop on binary analysis and reverse engineering uh, with John Hammond. And we taught a bunch of .NET developers why they don't code C. Uh, it was, uh, there's a learning cliff that goes on there. But we'll do the same sort of thing. So my journey kind of began about a year and a half ago. It's probably been about 18 months now. 78 uh, weeks, exactly. It was, it, the, the impetus for change for me, what? 78 weeks, you're checking. Okay, 78 weeks, yes, yeah, 78 weeks. That's good, that's a good idea. Uh, it started at CCF in 2022. Uh, went out, had a merry time. The hotel bar closed at nine. Uh, so conference tip for everyone that's new here. Don't leave the hotel after 9 p.m., right? So the, the, uh, the, the thing is, is that in the hotel, it's a safe space. The bar normally closes at a reasonable time. You can stumble back to your room no matter how much you drink. As soon as you go off site, you're pseudo trapped with the group you're with. And the bars are open way later out of here, and it, it can be a bad time. So it, it, this culminated in uh, me getting way too drunk with uh, Mr. Shane Deegan of uh, Threat Locker. And uh, waking up 7 a.m. the next morning in a weird spot. Uh, it turns out I was in the bathroom of a construction site. <laughs> uh, I, I passed out in a bathroom in a Whole Foods construction site. I had to stumble back to the hotel going, how the fuck did I get here? And what am I doing with my life? I uh, hit about 316 pounds at about that time. Uh, I'm down, probably getting on 60 now since then, uh, depending it fluctuates. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, now I still drink at these things. I mean, you guys have mostly all hung out with me. I try to drink a little bit less to excess, 
right? I'm an, I'm an introvert, honestly, I really am, uh, and no one here will believe that, but it I drains my social what battery. What you said to me the first time we spoke is you're extroverted online and introverted in real life, yeah. which I think yes, is good. that. So it, it drains my social battery to, to, hang, to do these things, uh, which is why oftentimes you don't see me staying in one spot too long, I just float around, it's my coping mechanism. Uh, I, again, lift now, uh, and I rewarded myself for getting down to the weight where I could skydive again by when we were at our lifting camp in Phoenix, a group of five of us went skydiving, and uh, it was pretty fucking awesome. Highly recommend for anyone that's not done it. So we hack health, we said lifting camp a couple of times, and you're thinking, what the fuck is, li well, what is lifting camp to you, Jason? Uh, lifting camp to me is where I go, hang out with people that I've become community with, uh, and we lift heavy things until we regret our life decisions. Uh, we, we definitely break ourselves. Uh, and then cope with margaritas. And then cope with margaritas. Uh, but I was laughing, you know, you, you use all your electrolytes up, and I mean, salt has sugar, or it has salt, margarita has salt on the rim, and then I sugar and the acid, so we recover doing that. Uh, this picture was taken in Phoenix, Yes, so we hack health, the mission, lifting camps, what the fuck are we talking about? Um, people will say it's not a cult, but we're definitely heading that it's way. A cult. Um, we hack health in general, the mission, I have found myself as a coach, as you can imagine, in a weird fucking space, um, essentially coaching people in tech, cybersecurity, hackers, and whenever I tell other coaches, they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, but it started with Dave Kennedy. Um, he was my first client in that space, and then through referrals, I was like, this is a weird place that I'm in now, but we decided to, uh, we decided to go all in on We Hack Health. We started a podcast, and the goal or the mission with We Hack Health in general is essentially to change the narrative of what essentially is a fucked up, slightly unhealthy industry. Uh, the lifting camps, as you said, are, we get together five or six times a year, um, we lift, we do something fun. really fun, fun. We do a fun thing. A fun thing, do we do? Uh, top golf. Oh yeah, we do in fun costumes. Um, we do something related to where we are. So we went hiking. Uh, Adam took us out in Phoenix. But it's more about building the community, building the connections, and actually trying to make sure that we tick all the boxes of what the framework is. So, like we said, we do consume margaritas, just not many, many of them. A few. Um, yeah. It's a little bit more controlled than a life I used to live. But the goal with We Hack Health is essentially to rewrite the narrative of what is a wholly unhealthy industry. Yeah, and so there's two components to this, right? Ben is obviously a coach that has paid clients, but what he's built is actually a community, not unlike MSP Geek. There's a Discord where all of us hang out and they support each other. Uh, there's a bunch of people from our space in there. They host a podcast, which has a lot of really good information on it, and that's how I found them. At some point or another, I decided I needed more, uh, so I leaned in as, a, uh, as uh, an actual client of Ben's. Uh, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been an interesting journey. Tell me. Cool. So the framework today we're going to go through the framework. We hack health, like what it's about, essentially what I use with clients and how I teach them. But first, yeah, first uh, we have so we the we hack we hack health movement believes not only in getting swole. Uh, it's not just about broccoli and biceps. It's not about lifting. Uh, it's actually, that is a side effect of the other things we do. And one of the things that we do do is we lean into uh, we lean into mindset and putting your head in the right space. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so as part of this, uh, I, we asked, I asked, uh, and Ben asked uh, Sean uh, from the uh, place called the 555 Club. Uh, they do guided meditation stuff to come in and do a couple minutes of breath work with us to try to set the pace here and mostly to calm the two of us on the stage down. It's more uh, so for us than it is gonna, for you guys. Yeah, so. You guys are going to have to put up with this, and we'll see if we can get Sean here. Are you there, Mr. Sean? Can you, oh, let me change. i got to change the audio source. It's coming out my speakers. Technical difficulties. There we go. Try now. Loud and clear? Yes, you are on. Beautiful. It's a very strange experience watching Ben and Jason present to a room full of people. Um, good to see everybody. Um, fair play for giving yourselves this space on a Monday morning. I'm going to do a few minutes of breath work, but before, like just a few minutes before that, I want to touch on why breath work. Um, these are 
breathwork, meditation, gratitude are tools that I came across on a prolonged cancer journey. I was diagnosed at 24, had a stem cell transplant at 26. At 26, later on, I was told that you're out of here, you're out of options, pack your bags. So at that point, you become pretty open to trying new things and exploring things that are going to help. Breathwork, meditation, gratitude are parts of what helped me. Uh, some people have misquoted me saying that Sean cured his cancer with breathwork. It's like, no, he did not. I liken any of these tools because they're simply tools to be used as an egg and a cake. Nobody eats a cake and says, what an amazing egg that is. But leave the egg out and you'll notice it straight away or take flour or take sugar or any one of those ingredients. So the idea for the breathwork, simply a tool, something that you can use, that you can lean on. The two fellas talking about being nervous. It's something that you can use. And breathwork is a direct link to your nervous system. It's how as humans we can communicate that we are safe. And also, if you focus on your breath, you're always going to bring yourself bang into this moment. So it's currently 17 minutes past nine, Monday morning with you. If you focus on your breath, you are right where your bum is or where your feet are. And this is the only place that you can affect change in your life. It's the only place where you can relax. It's the only place that you can take action. It's the only place that you can move the needle in your health, your career, your relationships, your business is right here, right now. Tomorrow doesn't exist. It's a fallacy that's sold um, by your brain to get you out of doing work today. Uh, on that so before we go in, we're just going to do two or three minutes of a 5-5 five, five breath. So this is fully through the nose. And if you can, I'm going to ask you to breathe into your belly. So like down in here, not up into the chest. Upper chest breathing is where we experience stress. It's what happens whenever we default in a tight situation. So we're taking the breath into the belly. And before we begin, I'll also ask, give this a lash for three minutes. I know Jason said, don't partake if you want. All you're doing is breathing through your nose. Try it for three minutes. If it's not for you, never touch it again. If it sparks your curiosity, it might lead you down a rabbit hole of uh, focus and overall wellness. You never know. So before we begin, just take stock of how you're sitting. I can't see anybody, but usually there's arms folded, people slouched over. Just notice your posture. Can you straighten up? Can you open your body a little bit more? Um, and even that being receptive, a physical openness opens you to the experience of the day. We've all given talks where someone's sitting with their arms folded, slouched over, and you just know there's nothing going in. So if you physically open, you're going to mentally open, and it's going to open you up to anything that may come after this presentation or after these few minutes. So before we get ready now, in, and Jason and Ben, please feel free to give yourselves a few moments as well. Starting in three, two, one, inhale, two, three, four, five, exhale, two, four, five, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale, in, exhale, in, exhale. In, exhale, inhale, exhale, letting the shoulders relax a little further, inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. 
Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Last one. Inhale. Exhale. And letting your body breathe any way that it wants to. No control, no restriction. And simply take a moment to check in. Notice what has changed, what has shifted, what has stayed exactly the same. Um, and even if throughout the day, throughout the rest of your week, throughout the rest of your year, life, if you can continually check back in, how's my posture? Where's my breathing at? Um, and what am I putting off that could be done right now? You'll see big changes. Um, thank you very much. I promised we were going to get weird. Uh, <clears throat> so... I find that if I'm ever in a position where I'm freaking out, like, you know, having to stand on stage in front of several hundred people and speak into a microphone, uh, things like breathing actually really help. So uh, <clears throat> I actually got this idea to have Sean come on uh, during a 40 minute connected breath session. Uh, I would do not recommend that for somebody that hasn't done this a while. It is a trip. Uh, I can only compare it to drugs. Uh, it is something. It is you. You go to a deep, dark inner space or somewhere, and it is insane. So I didn't think it was possible, but it's kind of crazy. But let's move on. So the framework. Um, I say framework because I think the biggest thing that I've realized as a coach is every single person is different. Everybody's needs is different. Their lives are different. Their goals are different. So I can't be super specific in what I prescribe. And we put these together, there were originally four, but I'll talk about that in a second, as to what we believe can help you. I'm clicking now, what one there for us? This one? The middle one, cool, perfect. Uh, we put these together essentially as tools, like we said. The first one, and I can absolutely say that this is the most important one, is mindset, lifestyle, and nutrition. And the goal with managing the three of these is essentially to help you think, feel, and perform to be a better you. Agree? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, these are uh, things that you do that you can change in yourself. And if you do those things, the fourth one, I think, is that right here? No, it's not yet. It's oh, spoiler. shit. We'll okay. talk about I'm, that. I'm spoiling it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I mean... This has been pretty awesome uh, as far as, especially the mindset and the lifestyle piece of it. Uh, nutrition comes with it. Uh, nutrition can be hard. Uh, when we get to nutrition, I'll talk a little bit about that, but man, conference food sucks. I think a point to get into on this is, if you have two without the third, it doesn't necessarily fit. So for example, if you have mindset and nutrition, but not the lifestyle, Yes, you can make change, but the goal with the lifestyle is so that you can do it essentially forever, so it fits with your life. If you have the lifestyle and nutrition, if you don't have the mindset, when the shit hits the fan with work, everything goes to shit, and you'll not be able to navigate the rest of it. We break it down into three sections per pillar. So mindset, we focus on mental resilience, growth mindset, and focus on mindfulness. So the stuff that we do with Sean, I also work with Kira. She is, uh, her name's not Ciara, by the way, it's Kira. The, uh, the focus and mindfulness, she is a holistic high performance coach is her title, a mindset coach. So we look, try to look after the whole human essentially and I will give Sean the credit for that. I don't know if he's still watching. If you're still watching Sean, you get the credit for that. The lifestyle piece, balancing personal and professional life. So being able to come to conferences and drink margaritas and be okay with it or eat donuts or have pizza with your family or ice cream or whatever your thing is. Uh, environmental optimization, so 
essentially your environment will dictate your performance, how you show up, how you feel, essentially will call peer pressure probably more than anything else, and habits and routines to help you sort of format that lifestyle. The nutrition one, which I see probably people struggle with the most, or they think they struggle with the most, being able to eat for energy, uh, changing your relationship with food, because I think we can all agree it's a little fucked up for everybody, and strategic meal planning that we'll get into in a second. So that is how the three pillars are made up. It did originally look like that, but I thought me trying to draw and spell with everybody watching me, it wouldn't work out too well. Yeah, we were originally going to cut to an iPad and he was going to draw it live, and then we did it yesterday and we're like, yeah, that's a bad idea. <laughs> so the fourth and final missing pillar, and I'll say this, whenever I started coaching, this probably tells you a little bit about the journey that I have been on as a coach. They were literally the opposite way around. So it was body, nutrition, lifestyle, and mindset. I should have put my original uh, BC training logo in because it was on them. So the pillars have remained the same for the past seven and a half years. They just come in a different order. Uh, these are a few of the before and afters, the journey, whatever you want to call it, of essentially what you get if you focus on the other three. Yeah, and I mean, not everyone wants to look like Mr. Kennedy there in the lower right-hand corner. I get that. I don't really want to look like that. I mean, that would be awesome, but I don't know what I would do. I would just crush rocks, I think. <laughs> so mindset. What does mindset mean to you? And this is an actual question for people to answer. Okay, so he says it's a, a space to create what you want to happen instead of just being reactive. Echoing is a good idea. Kelvin, what's mindset mean to you? <laughs> good. Five more. Okay, Mr. Lee uh, shared that it's it's the uh, it's the lens basically that you view the world from. Yeah, I, I'd take that one. Ray? Yeah. Sounds familiar. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. I know from. that guy. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yes. So Ray basically said, uh, just to pair it back, that you know you can lean in and make mistakes and realize that in the grand scheme of things, one or two days in any direction, one or two days healthy isn't going to make you healthy. If you're mostly healthy, one or two days of staying up with your friends until three in the morning drinking margaritas isn't going to make you unhealthy. Mindset is realizing that that exists. What about you? What? What about you? Oh, me. And they stole the good ones. Uh, I mean, mindset to me is putting myself in this uh, position where uh, I live the dichotomy, right? It's like I, uh, I've been doing a lot of event travel. I do a lot of public speaking. I come to a lot of these sorts of things. And uh, these events are about excess, right? They're about uh, celebrating and being present in these fleeting moments that we get to spend with this community that we know, but only virtually, right? So it's like we're a group, and I have a core group of friends, obviously, that I hang out here with, and it's like we get back together and it's like we never left. But the mindset piece of that is knowing that I do all of the work I do all of the time so I can come here and do this and feel okay doing it and not kill myself, right? Not, uh, not become overtly unhealthy, not, uh, maybe not wake up in a Whole Foods, maybe not wake up, right? It, the, the things that happen in our industry and, and just being okay with the fact that if I put myself in a good position, I can make it through it. For me, mindset is being able to do the thing or execute on the thing regardless of what your emotion is towards it. And I think that that's exactly why Jason brought me here today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we announced this track, I immediately reached out to Mendy and said, I have the guy. That, that will be our speaker. Uh, I, I may have bullied a little bit, uh, but he's here. I am, I am. I, I guess I don't like public speaking, and that is why. So I'm here doing it regardless of what my emotions are towards it, because I yeah. think it'll be beneficial for the greater good, and because he asked me to. 
but I am in control of your training and nutrition, so you're fucked next week. <laughs> <coughs> so our goal with mindset is to cultivating a productive and resilient mind. As we said, through developing mental resilience, fostering a growth mindset, and enhancing focus and mindfulness. We don't have time to go through them all, so we're gonna just touch on developing mental resilience. And I'm gonna throw you under the bus. Yeah. Uh, as, I, as we mentioned, uh, I, for a long time, have been really heavy, right? Like I was uh, at 316 pounds at my highest. Uh, I told myself that if I got light enough to skydive again, I would skydive. And somebody brought it up just in passing uh, in Phoenix. And I'm like, let's fucking go. And it is a very uncomfortable place uh, to, I would say, jump out of a perfectly working airplane. But most of the planes I've ever jumped out of are not, I, I don't know that I would want to land in them, honestly. <laughs> Uh, but it, the mental resilience to leave an airplane and fall for 60 seconds towards the ground and not uh, lose your mind or uh, lose control of bodily functions is there is a certain amount of mental resilience that, uh, that comes along with doing that. I think for me, I was going to put a slide in here of me. I'm a fan of doing ice baths, not for whatever bullshit that Andrew Huberman is trying to tell you about brown fat stores. Just because I don't want to do it, but I think the jumping out of a plane is definitely a trump card on that. So um, I think a learned skill through training and the gym, putting yourself in difficult positions, lifting heavy things over and over again. And we spoke about this yesterday, like that's something that you can actually tangibly see the yeah. progress in. Has taught me to be able to do difficult things and use that as a transferable skill to do shit like this or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, part of a... Uh, uh, Ben puts me in my uncomfortable zone all the time, right, for a, a better mindset. Uh, I had my own version of cold plunge. The day we jumped out of that airplane, it was 39 degrees on the ground. Uh, you can only imagine what it was at 14,000 feet. Uh, so 60 Can't imagine seconds. I would be thinking, oh, it's so cold up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so part of my reason for bringing Ben here was to put him in his uncomfortable place because he does it to me all the time. And this has definitely been more than 30 seconds. So mindset. Your ability to do hard things regardless of what your emotions are towards them. Lifestyle? Lifestyle. Yeah. What does it mean to you? Oh, lifestyle. Lifestyle is who you surround yourself with and what you choose to do, right? It's, uh, I am, I generally uh, try to put myself in a position where I'm surrounded by people that make me feel welcome, that appreciate me. Uh, that uh, support me, that are willing to look out for me uh, when bad shit happens. Uh, we've definitely, over the years, I've definitely cut people out of my life that just don't align with that lifestyle, style, right? Like, it, it, to take this back to, like, the MSP space, right, as you operationally mature as a company, you may find that you're a mismatch now with clients, right, because you're operationally more mature than they are, and it, it becomes a mismatch. Same thing happens in your life, right? As you operationally mature your lifestyle, you may find that you have friends that just don't fit that lifestyle anymore and you have to move on from them. Yeah, and the people that I used to hang out with when I used to party shoot the bottle of Hennessy, and he, and they're not in my life anymore, as you can imagine. The lifestyle piece, and Adam's gonna touch on his talk on this later on, everybody's lifestyle is different, and my goal as a coach is essentially to meet you where you're at and work out the things that we can improve to give you the momentum to keep you going. It's about how you can do all of the things go to conferences, hang out with your family, and be able to navigate all the things, but still make progress towards your goal. Building a life for a better you through, as we said, daily routines and habits, environment optimization, and balancing personal and professional life. I don't have time for all three. Out of curiosity, has anyone here read Atomic Habits? Okay, it's a good book. If you haven't read it, I recommend. It's basically get 1% 1 better over time, and it compounds. Those are compounding gains. Uh, so the daily routines and habits can really go there. But we're going to focus in a little more on environmental optimization. Which I think is relevant to your environment right now. And I think being okay with the fact that you know that this could be a potential shit show in terms of alcohol consumption, staying up late, et cetera, et cetera. But knowing that you're not doing this all of the rest of the time. The people that you hang around with, the people you surround yourself with. But even going the other way, right? Like, uh, yes, I'm guessing some non-zero amount of this room will probably overconsume. Uh, they, uh, they will maybe make some bad choices, but you've also made really good choices, 
right? Like to be in this room surrounded by people that all want to get better, how can you not help but get better when you surround yourself with a sea of betterness, right? Like lean into that, right? Like you have made a lifestyle choice by choosing to come to a place with education, right? This conference, any other conference, any learning environment uh, to improve yourself, right? That is a lifestyle choice you are making to do that. Agree, and that's again, the community aspect of we hack health in general is what it's about. It's about the environment, and I always give the community and my clients more credit than myself because I can't provide what they can provide in terms of the surrounding, the support. Essentially, 100 people across the world who are all willing to support and motivate each other that can also come and hang out in front of a fire and drink margaritas after absolutely torturing themselves with Adam in the gym. Your surroundings impact your behaviors, essentially. Nutrition, you talk about donuts. Oh yeah, I love donuts. Who doesn't like donuts? Sorry, Matt Lee. <laughs> Matt Lee has a flower allergy, so he gets the saddest kind of donuts. I feel bad for him. The piece on nutrition for me is, I find in the past that when people start to look after their health or go on a weight loss journey or whatever the thing is, they just fucking get rid of all the stuff that they enjoy. I'm like, what the fuck sort of life is that to live? So my goal is to show how we can still continue to keep these things in, the things that you enjoy. I specifically remember one client that I started just after COVID. And he was like, look, before we move forward, my wife and I have been making pizza every Friday through COVID, can we keep that in? I'm like, fuck yeah, keeping pizza in? Like, absolutely keep that in, because that's essentially ties into the lifestyle, also feeds into nutrition, and you can manage to do this forever, and a life without pizza would be shit, I think. So, Fueling for optimal performance, eating for energy, improved relationship with food, and strategic meal planning. I think probably the most important with this is the improved relationship with food, because I'll say we'll go fault and responsibility. I don't necessarily think the generation before us, it's their fault with how they quote unquote taught us how to eat because they didn't know any different. But I think our generation now, we have the tools, the knowledge, the availability of better quality foods, that it's our responsibility to change that relationship for ourselves and future generations. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with that, right? Like we, uh, my diet is a lot different than it was a year ago or even two years ago. Uh, and it's not bad. Do I still go out and have fun? Yeah, I do. I still come to things like this. I eat too much. Uh, I, instead of having the breakfast in there though, <clears throat> I went and got a protein shake from the little store, right? And I had a protein shake for breakfast uh, to help me hit my protein goals because I do have a protein goal every day uh, and to help me keep full longer and to not over consume on what I imagine was probably bacon. Is there bacon in there? No bacon, okay. Okay, then I didn't miss out on bacon. Improve relationship with food. So. How has your relationship with food improved in the past 70, 80 years? I figured out it's possible to eat 1,900 calories a day and still get 160 grams of protein. At this point, I might just buy a chicken farm. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, it's, uh, it, a lot of it is realizing that uh, and this, I, I will put blame on our former, uh, our former generations before us. Uh, here in America, we have a lot of food that falls into the ultra-processed category, right? It's like I, we, we stopped having to forage for food like some many thousands of years ago. We probably don't need to calorically pack all of our food to the point where we do it, right? Like uh, uh, I was hanging out with uh, a couple of the people that work for Ninja earlier this week, and there was bread. They're like, is this bread or just sugar loaf, right? Because the American bread has considerably more sugar than the European bread does. Uh, and so my relationship with food is, you know, maybe it costs a little more, but I'm seeking out the bread that isn't full of sugar, right? I'm seeking out, uh, uh, we went to lunch yesterday, what, you know, across the street at that Mexican joint, I wanted tacos. Adam set the precedent and ordered a taco salad with double chicken. No, Adam set the precedent and said, yes, we'll have bottomless margaritas. <laughs> But I will have the taco salad with double chicken. <laughs> yes, that, that definitely happened too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's making those choices, right? It's like knowing that, uh, well, click to the next thing. It's, it's right there at the bottom. 
you're going to eat like an asshole for the weekend, don't eat like an asshole during the week. <clears throat> uh, we... During, yes, during the week, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, oh, it's that's Irish. Cool. It's it Irish. Irish. For <laughs> anyway. So, this is the framework that we use. I use it with clients. I have done for many years. It has been iterated and changed over time. Uh, as we said, we don't have time to go through all of the things, but hopefully there's things there that you can take away that you can essentially put to practice immediately. If you're gonna eat like an asshole tonight, just don't eat like an asshole all day. If you're gonna eat like an asshole and drink too much at this conference, maybe when you get home, take a little bit of time and eat some salad, right? Like uh, 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 detox, maybe don't drink for a little bit, right? Like uh, the, the rule here, I think that with all of this stuff is if you attempt a 100% adherence to anything, you will almost certainly fail, right? So the goal here internally and in all of it, mindset, body, nutrition, is follow the 80-20 or the 90-10 rule, right? Like if you're good, generally good 80% of the time, then that 20% of the time that you lean into, you're at a conference with all your friends and you want to drink, or you need to get three hours of sleep in a row for six nights in a row because <clears throat> you're only going to get to see these people for this week. You can do that, right? Like, the law of large numbers applies here, right? The, the, the thought that you, you're not going to make yourself fat and angry or fat and weak in a day, right? It's going to take time. And I think that uh, in one of the early podcasts that they have, uh, Dave, the other coach, kind of leaned into that. Like, the first time you go on this journey, you go out <laughs> – and you're out with your friends, and the next thing you know, you've eaten an entire pizza. And you're like, I'm gonna be fat again. No, you're not. You're gonna get on the scale in the morning, and it's gonna suck, because it's gonna be really high. But the, the weight is all water. Like, there's no possible way for you to gain like eight pounds of fat overnight, right? It's gonna be water weight, because you ate an entire salt mine worth of salt, and you drank too much, and you have water. Now, if you drank way too much, it might actually not be a shit show because you're so dehydrated that it's going to actually be down. Uh, ask me how I know. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's, it's uh, going through those things. Yeah. So some hard truths. I'm always very transparent whenever I have it. First of all, I just want to say I'm not here telling you what to do. If you want to go and drink and get fucked up, I'm okay with that. Be okay with the result on the other side of it, whether you want to go and eat a pizza and whatever, I'm not here to tell you what to do. But some hard truths, and I try and be fully transparent whenever I have initial calls with clients because there's no point in me selling the dream, and then it's a fucking shit show whenever you get in. The first one is there are no shortcuts, and I think the biggest thing within this is we want everything to happen immediately. We yeah. want the other coaches I see sell a fucking six-week beach body program. I'm like, cool, good luck with that. But my favorite thing about seeing someone physically and mentally change is I know the time that has to go into that and the work that has to go into it. So I respect them for the work that they have been able to put in. Yeah, I mean, it, it took me 42 years of my life to get up to 316 pounds. The thought that I could suddenly be 230 pounds in six months, that's just not going to happen, right? So you, you got to do the work. I know there's a lot of like drugs out there that have, maybe have some benefit, but I know people on them, right? And they're like, I've lost all this weight. And it's like, yeah, but what happens when you're done, right? If you haven't changed your life, your lifestyle and your mindset, then it's just going to be a roller coaster. You're going to come off of that diet. You're going to start eating like an asshole again. And then the weight's all going to come back on. And I will tell you from experience, it comes on quicker and, it, and you end up higher than if you had just left well enough alone, right? Uh, because a lot, of those, uh, a lot of those drugs work by, essentially it's calories in, calories out. They work by somehow causing you to be in a caloric deficit uh, via some sort of chemical brain shit they magic. do. It's yeah, magic. magic. Uh, and when you come off of that, that's gone, right? Like you haven't suddenly decided that, that your mind hasn't switched and say, well, I'm full really quick. The drug that makes you not full goes away, and now you're ravenously hungry. And you eat too much, and you gain it back. I think that the time that you put in, and again, whenever I started with a client, like it's a 12-month commitment to join, and I believe that it takes at least that time to build the habits, build the behaviors, to actually change so you can manage to do it longer term. The next one, and this can be a difficult pill to swallow for a lot of people, um, this is Jocko, my mate that I did some BJJ with this time last year. 
Um, if you haven't read his book, Extreme Ownership, I'm not here to tell you it changed my life, but it definitely did have an impact. Um, essentially, the way that I look at this is every decision you have made in your life up until this point has put you in this position, good or bad, ugly, whatever way you want to frame it. And I actually had a conversation with Sean about this last week. The first time that he was told that his cancer was his fault, fuck you. And then he sat and thought about it. Um, and he said, well, if this has been my fault and I can make the decisions from this point to change that, then that's what I'm gonna do. So there's a freedom in recognizing that all of your decisions have brought you to this point because all of your decisions from this point can essentially bring you to wherever you need to be. And I think as a society, we've kind of grown into this like blame culture. I have a, again, nine and 12 year old boys and it's their favorite thing. Like my son the other day played soccer like absolute shit. And at the end of the game, I'm like, what happened? He's like, well, I didn't have any water. It fell out of my bag. It, and I'm like, well, whose fault is that? Like, could you have gone back? It, it was halfway between the car and the field. He could have walked back. He was on the, when he was on the bench or at halftime and gotten his water bottle. Well, it's the bag designer's fault for making the pocket too loose. So, what, are you kidding me? <laughs> there, I, so my response to that was, there are 12 kids on your team, and you are the only one that seems to consistently drop your water bottle. So whose fault is it? Or the same thing, I absolutely hate the term overserved. Like, is the bartender supposed to sit back there with, like, an individual clicker for every person? Oh, no, you've had seven drinks. You're done now. You can grow up. You drank too much. <laughs> like, it, it, I, it was... It'd be easy to go, you know, that Shane Deegan guy's an asshole. Like, he, uh, because of him, I woke up in a Whole Foods. I'm the dumbass that drank five Irish car bombs in 90 minutes. He had no part of that. Right? Like, uh, yeah, I, in hindsight, I forgot they had Jameson. I literally just thought they were Bailey's and Guinness. And, and then until I, yeah, until I saw him pour the last one and immediately went, I have made a grave error. Uh, but yeah, I mean, own, own the outcome, own the responsibility. That is the decisions you make, right? It's not, it is, it, I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and say, hey Ben, it's the conference's fault I didn't hit my nutrition goal this week because the food wasn't high protein and I couldn't get enough protein in there. I made the decisions, supplement with protein shakes when I need to, I'll go across the street and eat a chicken taco salad and margaritas. Uh, and you know, you, you, it is, I, I'm in control of changing those things to make them better if I want to. Agreed. The last point in this, uh, this is my good friend, Matt. He mentors coaches and he, his phrase is, no one's coming to save you, expect a self rescue. And I think the point on this is I can give Jason the tools. I can give anybody the tools, the meal plan, the guidance, access to Sean, Kira, insert, whatever it is. I can go on the journey with them, but I can't do the fucking work for you need to do it yourself yeah it's a, uh i mean in the end if you live a reasonably unhealthy life the only person that's potentially going to come save you is the emt when something bad happens right like this all ties together again it's personal responsibility you own your outcome take one points yeah so if you take anything out of this uh i believe that this framework is great and I think doing it in this order is good spend some time right get your mindset in order shit is hard lean into it cut bullshit out of your life make priorities right I think you're the one that told me that or maybe it was Adam right it's like I didn't have time for that is the shittiest excuse that has ever existed it wasn't a priority right it's not that you don't have time if it was a priority you would make time Right, and sometimes the decisions are made. Uh, my check-in last week was a shit show because uh, I was traveling, immediately came home, went to a soccer tournament with my son, had three days home with my wife and kids before uh, coming to an event I came to right before this one. I won't see my kids again until Saturday when my wife and kids are flying down. I'm missing their last week of school. I'm missing my son's sixth grade clap out. So during that two days, three days I had home, it was a priority of me to spend time with them, right? It wasn't a priority to spend that time in the gym murdering myself. Now I did get to the gym twice and I absolutely murdered myself in, in exchange for the fact that I wasn't gonna get there, but everything, these are priorities. And okay, that's, that's okay. Like understand that sometimes we can push in terms of your progress and sometimes life will push back at you. And that's fine. And I think the nutrition piece for itself. You want to do lifestyle? The one that, the you do lifestyle. The lifestyle? Your decisions. 
the decision that we made yesterday. Adam said he wanted to have bottomless margaritas. I had ordered a water. I had ordered a water and Diet The Coke. girl was like, if you're going to have bottomless margaritas, everybody at the table needs to have a bottomless margaritas. And we went, okay. Yeah. And that was a decision that was okay. And I think being okay with those decisions in that moment is fine, but I'll not be doing it again today. And then nutrition, right? Like, again, if you're going to... The law of large numbers applies here. It'd be good most of the time. We set one of the things that is huge in this program that I never really considered is we set our calorie goals. We I have a daily calorie goal, but I have a weekly calorie goal, right? That gives me a lot more tools. When you zoom out, everyone's so focused on the now, but when you zoom out, it's about 3,500 pounds of cal caloric deficit to lose a pound of weight in general. That 3,500 pounds can happen in any time period. It doesn't have to happen in a week or in a day, right? So, like, if you have, uh, if you have something coming up or a birthday party, and you know you're just gonna like mow cake, maybe the couple of days beforehand, eat a couple hundred less calories, be a little more protein centric, right? And and kind of save up those calories for that shit show you know is coming, right? Like I, when I, when I leave here, I will uh, in the gap week I have before secure. Uh, be very mindful of my eating uh, because I know that this was probably excess and I know that that will be excess, right? But on the grand scheme of things, I can help average that out a little bit uh, by being more mindful on the bigger stage. I agree. Where to find us? If anybody wants to know any more information on We Hack Health on all social media platforms, we are just at We Hack Health. The site, if you want to listen to the podcast, is wehack.health. Questions? Questions. Hold on. Before we do questions, turn around. Feels sus. I had to get Ben some proof that he was actually here and actually did it because uh, <laughs> in Phoenix we were supposed to run a 5K and uh, he didn't. I forgot, and he told my, me, I forgot my running trainers. He told me he did. So uh, that was I was me. I was I providing. I was providing accountability to the group that he actually did get on stage with us and didn't just tell us he was gonna and then stop. So questions, anyone got any questions? I don't. I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, I mean, 100%, I'll do it tomorrow is probably the biggest excuse. Uh, and I think about, Six weeks ago, you called me out in it uh, in my check-in. So every week, I give him feedback, giant-ass Google sheet of a bunch of data, uh, and then some qualitative things that I talk about the week, biggest wins, biggest losses, lesson. And uh, uh, the lesson I kind of self-realized was uh, every day it was really busy, uh, and I would just say, well, I'll work out this evening. And then I come home and realize that, oh, I've got – get the kids to soccer, I have a scout meeting, like we have the MSP GeekCon planning meeting, I, Kyle didn't call this out, but like we've been meeting uh, Tuesday evenings every other Tuesday for like the past six months. So, you know, you've given up an hour and a half, two hours on most of those Tuesdays. Uh, and then you're like, okay, well, I'm not gonna get to it tonight because I have a real hard time after 9 p.m. I'll get to it in the morning, to sleep. You wake up in the morning, you're like, I'm fucking tired, and you go back to sleep. Stop doing that. Like, stop, uh, uh, stop putting things off. It's an excuse. Uh, how has the change affected my day-to-day -day work life? It's interesting, and I, we probably should have zoomed in on this a little more in the, in the talk. Uh, we'll know for next year. I have uh, considerably more energy and a considerably higher ability to focus. Uh, I, uh, what works best for me is uh, three days a week, at least two days a week, Monday, Friday for sure, uh, I attempt to leave at lunch to go lift. And uh, my team has, uh, there are several of them sitting there, uh, they've bolted me out of those lifts. I'll tell you what, you want to see Cranky Jason get pre-workout in me and then pull me out of the gym. I'm like Jason on speed. Yeah, uh, but I find that on the days that I spend and take that hour and a half for myself, because it's a longer lunch, and I, and I felt terrible about it at first that I was spending all that time, but on the days that I lift, I am more mentally engaged, I'm more focused, I get more done, 
I squirrel a little bit less than I do when I uh, don't lift, and I just generally feel better. So I actually find that I get more done on the weeks I take two hour and a half lunches to lift or work out at lunch than I do on weeks that I'm so busy that I have to work through lunch because it's just busy bullshit. I, I see, I mean, we can use you again as an example. Like time is the, the biggest excuse and when we first started, I think you told me that you had availability of two half-hour sessions yep. across the week. And when I'm in on that call initially and I'm saying, well, if you do this, you'll get more done by taking time away from work. People think I'm fucking crazy, which fair enough. But whenever you start to see it yourself, that you, whenever you put the hours in and the work in in the gym, that you can then actually do more, focus better, be more efficient with the work that you do do, all of a sudden you've got more fucking time and you're like, oh, maybe I could do yeah. a third session a week and maybe they could be 45 minutes. Yep. And I mean, and the other thing that's come as part of this journey is uh, uh, I finally lost enough weight that I decided I could go back to the doctor. Uh, when you get to a certain weight, you just stop going to the doctor because you know they're going to yell at you because you're heavy. Uh, so, you know, I got all those, the blood work and stuff you get done. Uh, it turns out my blood pressure and everything's fine, but I had like a couple of micronutrients and hormones. I'm, I was low testosterone and uh, I'm on a journey now to start to correct that. And even balancing hormones, uh, and uh, micro, mac, or micronutrient levels. I'm also vitamin D deficient. If you don't live in Florida, if you live in a northern state, you're probably vitamin D deficient. I'm vitamin B12 deficient. Even getting those back to the right levels via supplementation has really helped. Yeah, so uh, Ray asked or said something about water. Uh, I try to drink four liters of water a day. Uh, I, a lot of, I think a lot of people are there. I know we're running low on time. Uh, a lot of people are broken in that they're, they're, they eat because they're thirsty, right? That little, sw at least me, that switch in my brain. It's like, I'm, man, I'm hungry. And then I have a glass of water. And it's like, I'm not hungry anymore. I must have just been thirsty. Uh, so I lean into trying to do four liters of water a day. Uh, that but even on that, too. like I think that hands up if you have coffee in the morning before you have water. Uh, half the room. So it's more you wake up and you haven't drank anything in however long you've been asleep for, hopefully at least seven hours. And you're dehydrated, but you think the coffee thing is going to be giving you energy. Whereas if you actually just drink some water and put that off for however long you need to put it off for, an hour, two hours, whatever it is, you'll find more benefit, number one, from being hydrated, but number two, actually get the benefits of caffeine on the other side. Hydrate before you caffeinate. Anyways, I think we're at...